glad for it. Uh, but it's in the start of a week, and we have a starting this week, very, very interesting program. I'm so pleased that the uh, Vice Prime Minister has joined us today. Thank you for coming. We were just talking very briefly, uh, my first opportunity to, to meet her. Um, Ukraine has just has fallen off the charts in Washington. We're so busy either with hurricanes or with tweets or something, you know, that we just don't focus on big fundamental underlying issues. And that's why I'm so grateful that, uh, that Vice Prime Minister has come. Uh, you know, we're, this is a sophisticated town when it comes to foreign policy, but we've got such a narrow attention span and we keep chasing after dead rabbits all the time. So we need her here and we need her here to lead a conversation where together we can, you know, keep a, a fresh perspective on what is happening in Ukraine. And it's very dynamic, obviously. But just because we don't know about it doesn't mean it isn't dynamic. And we're going to have a, an opportunity, privilege today, to learn more through uh, the Vice Prime Minister's uh, message to us. Um, I, I forgot to say, when we, we have when we have events like this with outsiders, we always start with a little safety announcement. Uh, uh, Olya is going to be responsible for your safety, so follow her direction. Instructions will go out right through this door if we have to leave. The stairs that take us down to the street is right around the corner, and we'll go down, take two left-hand turns, and we'll go over to the courtyard for National Geographic, where we've got a mutual support agreement. I think they have ice cream for everybody, so we'll go over there. And nothing's going to happen, but I want you just to be prepared in case we have to. Follow Olya, please. Um, I'm going to be very brief the, uh, with, uh, because Ivanya Klimpush Tinsadze, challenging, challenging uh, is, uh, is a very talented individual who's had deep experience both in government and in our world, in the policy world. Uh, she headed up the East West Center. Uh, in Ukraine for a number of years. She's been an active uh, commentator. She was a she commentator for the BBC for a time, uh, and which is why you have, we have such exceptional English, which uh, we're always grateful for. Uh, and I want to say how pleased we are that she could be here. Uh, she was pulled up. Uh, she came into government in the Rada fairly recently and was lifted up to the top very quickly. And I think it's because of her enormous talents and so I think we should uh, we're all going to be lucky and grateful to have her here so would you with your applause please welcome and thank uh, the Vice Prime Minister for joining us today please thank you. thank you Dr. Hamre for warm welcome and I'm extremely grateful and uh, honored to be Speaking today at CSIS, I think it's a real privilege to be here in the place which is home to so many intellectuals and so many um, influential opinion leaders. Um, especially, I think it's extremely symbolic that um, I'm speaking here today on September 11th when we are commemorating um, the um, victims of the um, attack on the United States, on the ter of the terrorist attack on the United States. I did happen to live here at that point um, along with my husband, and I do take it also as a very personal story, so I'm using this opportunity to once again um, uh, reiterate uh, both our condolences to American people for the losses of that 9-11 terror attack and also to underline that this is exactly um, one of the reasons why we can speak today with more power, with more strength about a common um, fight against, against terrorism, a common fight against aggression, against the attempts to try to change the international order by the use of force. And that's why I think we are, we are standing together um, these days. Uh, one of the most prominent uh, personalities and statesmen who has been um, part of the CIS family 
uh, late Zbigniew Brzezinski, um, as you might very well recall in his uh, book, The Grand Chessboard, actually at some point said that um, without Ukraine, Russia ceased to be uh, the Eurasian empire. And I think this today um, is the um, notion that can be um, just repeated and is the notion that is um, underlying the very unique and very indivisible role that Ukraine is playing uh, for the European and Euro-Atlantic security. In my opening uh, remarks, I would like to concentrate a little bit on um, more on a Ukraine-US relationship, and I would not go into very specific things that are happening in Ukraine, but I will be happy to take your questions and to, to go into those details if they are of interest for you um, during our Q&A period. So um, I think I will not open any secrets or I will not open any news if I, if I say that um, Ukraine today is um, by paying a really high security price for defending itself, but also for depend, uh, defending a uh, Eastern democratic frontier of Europe is, has passed a point of no return uh, in our cause for freedom and democracy. Uh, we are very happy that notwithstanding the, the very difficult way that we had to go through for ratification of the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement, it finally has, paid, uh, has come into force as the 1st of September, and none of the countries, believe me, none of the countries that has ever signed, uh, signed the association uh, agreement with the EU had to go through such a long and such a, a uh, difficult uh, path in order to have it signed, in order to have it ratified uh, by all nations. So we are very happy that finally this um, basically roadmap for transformation of Ukraine is coming into full force and is becoming also obligatory not only for Ukraine but for all of the European uh, Union member states. And that gives us another uh, possibility and impetus for a real uh, deep transformation in the country. And so these changes of social, um, social economic um, uh, nature, uh, democratic changes that are happening in Ukraine are going along with the efforts um, in, um, in our attempt to uh, conduct a um, deep and comprehensive security and defense sector reform, thus adhering to NATO standards uh, and, and bring our nation closer to the Euro-Atlantic community. Unfortunately, uh, on this path, um, we are facing quite a few serious challenges and we are fighting several wars at the same time. One is the war inside um, um, for transformation of the country, the war with the old bureaucratic system, with the oligarchic system, the world uh, of the, um, the, the war with, uh, with the remnants of the Soviet empire inside of the country. And the other war is an external war, fighting against Russian uh, external aggression in the East and uh, fighting also by diplomatic and uh, political means for returning back our territories and, and uh, restoring our territorial integrity uh, in Crimea as well. And Russian aggression um, against Ukraine continues to challenge not only Ukrainian uh, security, but European and Euro-Atlantic security and international order. And therefore, for us, the leadership of the United States in this, um, in this process of um, deterring this um, challenge is extremely important, and, and it remains critical for the um, security in the region and for the security in our country. And we are grateful to the strategic partner of the U.S. Uh, the U.S. is a, being a strategic partner for this support that we are getting uh, for our country. And in recent months, I'm sure we have all been watching very closely. Uh, we have uh, seen a uh, positive uh, dynamics in the uh, dialogue on the political and economic uh, levels 
on high and highest levels between the US and Ukraine. The meetings that President Poroshenko has held with President Trump, uh, with uh, Vice President Pence, uh, the consequent visit, visits of uh, Secretary of State Tillerson and Secretary of Defense uh, Matisse uh, to Ukraine, uh, anticipated visit of the uh, Secretary for Energy Rick Perry to Ukraine in the nearest uh, months, that is all uh, demonstrating that we are finally getting to a very practical uh, things in our cooperation between our countries. And, and uh, these are both reaffirming the support from the US to Ukraine, but at the same time uh, creating a very specific and very um, positive agenda for both countries in cooperation with each other. And uh, for us, it's extremely important that the US administration is uh, uh, showing a strong um, uh, stance, strong position in terms of, um, of the uh, Russian occupation of Crimea and Donbass. And uh, we are uh, welcoming these positive steps that have been done by the uh, administrations in ter uh, administration in terms of appointing the, um, you know, high caliber diplomat Ambassador Kurt Walker to be a U.S. representative in negotiations on Ukraine. Um, so we are hoping that all of these steps to get taken together will uh, create additional pressure and will in ensure that uh, we will get closer to the solution of this international co conflict that we are finding ourselves part of. Uh, I hope that uh, U.S. will be considering closely the possibility and and will support Ukraine in deploying the UN peacekeeping mission to the temporary occupied uh, territories in, of Donbass and specifically to the border between Ukraine and Russian Federation as it was suggested by Ukraine in 2015, in early 2015 by President Poroshenko. We can go into more details on the recent um, um, counter um, suggestion by uh, President Putin, if um, it's, it will be of interest for you. Uh, we are extremely valuing also the bipartisan support of the Congress that we are enjoying, um, and we understand that this is the signal of the support of the American people for Ukraine and for the democracy and for, for the rule of law and few, for human rights on the territory of Ukraine. And we are happy that Congress is ensuring that, that the U.S. is min maintaining that security, uh, the level of assistance, security assistance that is uh, important for Ukraine, but not only security assistance, but also support of uh, uh, reforms um, in in the country. Uh, we are happy and grateful for the strength and stance also on the sanctions policy towards Russia, and we believe that um, it's important to 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 carry on this role for the United States in terms of also coordination and uh, lead, leading the uh, European nations um, in this endeavor. Uh, because unfortunately, Russian Federation is understanding only the um, language of pressure and uh, f power as opposed to uh, to dialogue. Over the last three years, um, uh, Ukraine has received uh, U.S. security assistance and. Uh, that was extremely important for our defense capacity and for, for it, our increased, enhanced defense capacity. We have enjoyed the train and equip programs that is go that are going on for our soldiers. We have uh, seen provision of some of the defensive equipment and support of the defense reform in Ukraine on different levels. And all of this, I believe, has really saved lives of Ukrainians. And all of this, I. Uh, I'm sure has made us much more resilient and much more capable in defending first and foremost ourselves and also in defending uh, the eastern frontier of um, uh, the European Western civilization. And uh, I also know that all of this experience of engagement of the uh, American, particularly instructor, uh, instructors, um, 
with Ukrainian soldiers, with Ukrainian military, also has been uh, extremely ins instructive and, and useful for American military as well, because they have been getting the uh, very direct access to the most recent first-hand combat experience of the hybrid, of fighting the hybrid war um, of Ukrainians um, against Russia, unfortunately, on our territory. So today, in order to get Russia retract from Ukraine and to stop rattling its military might on NATO borders, it does need to get a very bold message from the uh, Western uh, world that um, it's it's extremely, it will be extremely expensive for Russia and it will be a paying a high price to continue this aggression. Therefore, we believe that um, defensive weapons to be provided to Ukraine, that's a matter of a conscious decision and of, of the US administration and we are very much hoping that this will finally come into, um, into being. And, um, if you remember that Ukraine throughout the history has been a, a really um, serious and devoted contributor of security for, uh, for the whole world, not only for the region. I'm sure nobody know, needs reminding, but we have given up our nuclear arsenal uh, in exchange for some uh, document which is called uh, uh, Budapest Memorandum that didn't really help us in, when we were attacked by one one of those nations uh, that were supposed to guarantee our security according to this memorandum. So um, we have really contributed to um, to the um, non-proliferation regime and and to its. Uh, um, ability to withheld all the challenges that we are see, seeing also today. Uh, but at the same time, we have learned also the very hard way that Russia is using the, that weaknesses and procrastination as an invitation to attack. And, uh, um, and therefore, we know by our own experience that only a, uni a unified and united stance will make sure that we can deter the aggression um, altogether. Um, once again, we, you know, um, just recently there was this um, um, sociological poll done in Russian Federation by Levada Center, I think it's June or July or early July, where um, it turns out that Russian people are um, seeing um, Stalin as the greatest man who has ever lived. And then Lenin is number two, according to Russian people. And um, uh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Putin is number two, Lenin is number four, and Einstein comes uh, number 16, even after Brezhnev. So when, when you're thinking about having a dialogue with the Russian Federation, when you're thinking about having a dialogue with, uh, with the nation that has um, a bit different, twisted understanding of the reality. Think about having a dialogue with the world that wh where uh, Einstein is basically inferior to Stalin, Brezhnev, Lenin, and Putin. Today, the challenges that the world faces are new and growing in dangerous space, and uh, definitely nuclear threat, uh, cyber attacks, hybrid warfare, all require really strong um, alliances and partnerships. and, and consolidated actions for common goals and, and reaching um, and, and defending common values and uh, support it and uh, uh, reintegrate it and at peace and democratically developed, economically prosperous Ukraine uh, with its um, unique experience in combating Russian aggression and non-proliferation -pro input and with the geopolitical potential can contribute really seriously to the security of the region, of the world, and of the Euro-Atlantic space. Um, so I think it's in common interest um, of um, European and Euro-Atlantic community to stand beside Ukraine, to protect the order, the international order that has been giving us the possibility to prosper and develop for the latest uh, quite a few decades. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take your questions.
Deputy Prime Minister, thank you so much. I thought that was uh, an excellent overview, and we, we are so, we're so pleased that um, you're here in Washington, you're here at CSIS to have this conversation. I think, I think it is um, Ukraine and the crisis uh, sparked by um, Russia's, uh, Russia's aggression against Ukraine is at the center of European security, and there's no, there's no resolution without there's no, there's no way forward for European security without resolving the question of Ukraine. So, and you can't resolve the question of Ukraine without Ukraine. And it's so critical for us to hear Ukrainian voices here in Washington, lest we forget that it's actually, there's a country here that, that's at the center of this. Um, part because of that, I wanna kind of come back to Ukraine and Ukraine's future. Mm -hmm. your, 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 your title is the Vice Prime Minister for Euro-Atlantic Integration. The question of integration is an interesting one as Europe reshapes, as uh, we see a tremendous uh, variation in, within the European Union countries even on how they're approaching things which, you know, they're, 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 it's easy enough to say shared European values, but if you look at Europe's evolution, they don't seem to necessarily be fully shared. Attitudes towards social change, immigration and diversity, all of these things are very different if you're looking at them from Poland, or from Norway, or from uh, or from France. So how does, or from the United States for that matter, how does Ukraine see its future, and how does Ukraine see integration in that context? Is there a model that Ukraine wants to follow, and does it think it's, that's the model that uh, the rest of the Euro-Atlantic space is following? Well, first and foremost, there is no, no one model in the European and Euro-Atlantic space to follow. So, which is also a very positive thing. So you can change from the best, uh, choose from the best practices. You can uh, build on um, experience of the others, and uh, um, that's what we will be, and we are trying to do already. But we will be doing further. Uh, my title is also about European and Euro-Atlantic mm -hmm. integration. So, therefore, these are kind of two basic pillars that are uh, very uh, seriously overlapping in the tasks that we have to carry out back in Ukraine in terms of internal transformation that we have to, to achieve um, in order to, to be um, compatible. And I think when, when we are talking about um, you know, um, integration, that's about most, most and foremost, this is about interoperability and not necessarily only in the military sense. So this is about interoperability of this procedures of also interoperability of the values. And you're rightly saying that yes, uh, Europe is going, and, and the US uh, for that matter, are going through a very challenging times when, when we are um, actually trying to figure out for ourselves, um, you are trying to figure out for yourselves, uh, quite a few European nations are trying to figure out for themselves uh, what exactly they stand for. And we see the, the, the uh, fight between different forces, internal mm -hmm. forces. And I think what we see right now, especially in Europe, is that the fact that Europeans have forgotten that their um, grandfathers have actually fought for very specific uh, values. I think that they have forgotten that um, something that they are taking for granted has had to be defended at some point. And that's exactly the process that is happening right now. So I am hoping that through this um, challenging times with the discussions that are happening in different European uh, and uh, American um, nations, we are going to come out with a much more solidified and a much more concrete understanding of what the shared values are. And so we are coming through this process uh, at the same time. But for us Ukrainians, you know, it's a difficult thing when, when, we, uh, when our people have been dying in Maidan, when our people are dying right now in, in, uh, in the east of the country, trying to defend our country. It, it's, it's sad to see how those values that we believe in are actually going through this, this rusty times and kind of bumpy times in, in the European, um, among European uh, countries. So I hope that challenge and, um, uh, how would you call it? The, 
examination of these values will actually make sure that um, Europeans will come back to something which was important for their grandfathers, and we will just meet on that on that uh, part of the of the integration of the values. Thank you. Um, on the integration theme, but a little closer to home. Um, even as Ukraine's looking at being part of a larger European community, there are divides within Ukraine. Um, and I wonder what planning exists, what thinking exists about unifying the country. And very specifically, um, one thing that has struck me is Ukraine is fighting a war to reunify the country, to regain control of territory it doesn't, con it doesn't control. What happens when it succeeds? How does Ukraine plan to ensure that those parts of the Donbas that have been um, that have been controlled by Russian-backed sep separatists, to whatever extent they control the situation, uh, can be fully Ukrainian, can feel Ukrainian, and that the rest of Ukraine sees them as Ukrainian? Well, I think we have to understand that so-called division in Ukraine does not in reality exist on the basis of any political division, on any ethnic, national, religious, or any other type of division of Ukraine. The division that everybody has been talking about has been created by politicians, that has been created also by um, active internal gains for 23 years in Ukraine before Maidan. I really think that they have been, um, cre this division um, as a notion, as a myth, has been also created by um, inactivity of the Ukrainian authorities of that time when they were allowing basically for a very um, insufficient economic model, uh, corrupt and, and um, partially even criminal economic model to develop in, in those regions that are, were said to be different, so quote and unquote. And, um, and, and, that, and the inability to actively engage with the society, with the people uh, of all uh, regions of Ukraine. Moreover, I'm not sure that, that you're um, aware there is um, uh, this um, sociological survey that has been conducted mm -hmm. in Ukraine since 2008, mm -hmm. um, if I'm not mistaken, by Schwartz model. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is actually showing very direct, directly that uh, values of uh, people from Lviv region, the very western region of Ukraine, and um, the uh, values of people of Donetsk region, the, I think everybody knows right now, right, the eastern region of Ukraine, are basically um, identical. So which would be a rev revelation for those who are all the time speaking mm -hmm. um, about yeah. division. So uh, therefore, I think it's also, and, and during the last couple of years, it has been um, even more poisoned by the Russian propaganda. And obviously, it's a, it's a big challenge for us that we, as Ukrainian uh, government, we do not have access to the uh, non-controlled territories, even information-wise. So we cannot even project our uh, you know, um, media to be part of the discourse that people are listening to on those territories. So we understand that people have been intoxicated and there is an, and there will need to be a really serious detox time, if you want, um, for making sure that people are able to think critically, to, to, um, to weigh things, to, uh, to look at things from different perspectives in order to assess things for themselves. So I think it's uh, it's about time uh, available, uh, which is which is a big serious commodity, <laughs> definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's about time available for um, for detoxication, mm -hmm. information and mindset detoxication of those people, and through that with economic integration, mm -hmm. with, econom with infrastructural development, with the economic um, progress, and with, um, you know, with investment, obviously, with the with, uh, ability to develop and, uh, for, for every single citizen, that will be the major part of the reintegration policy. Okay. 
I'm going to ask one more question before um, letting the uh, letting our wonderful audience, to which I'm very grateful uh, for being here, um, ask some questions of their own. I want to come back to you mentioned that from from the very start, from back from 2014, um, President Poroshenko asked for a UN peacekeeping force, mm -hmm. um, and at, at that time and since, Moscow had been uh, categorically opposed. Now suddenly the Kremlin is proposing UN peacekeepers, but only along the line of contact in a very, very narrow, um, um, with a very narrow mission of protecting monitors. And of course, Kiev is interested in a much more expanded presence. This said, do you think this Russian chain of position provides an opening? Is, is there room to actually get a real UN peacekeeping force in with, uh, with the Russians having said this? Is this a negotiation that's worth pursuing? Well, first and foremost, um, I think that UN peacekeeping mission um, with access to the full non-controlled territory um, of Ukraine and uh, to the border between Russian Federation and Ukraine would definitely uh, be the possibility to, to break the stalemate of the Minsk agreements, uh, which we are finding ourselves in. And, um, Ukraine has been putting this on the agenda for quite a while, as I said, even officially so. The uh, Security, UN Security Council and the Secretary General has been approached by the Ukrainian President after the decision of the Ukrainian Parliament back in uh, early um, April of 2015. And yes, Ukraine is looking for a real objective um, and um, capably equipped um, mission. Uh, UN peacekeeping mission to the territory of Ukraine. What we see right now with the Russian reaction, um, mm, well, first, it's probably a positive thing that there is an opening of the discussion. But my feeling is that it's a uh, attempt to hybridize, if you want. I don't know whether there is an English word, but. Um, Hybrid means everything to everybody now, so you can do anything you want <laughs> well, with it. Well, it's, 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 it's an attempt to actually uh, twist the idea and present something from the Russian Federation that is not necessarily corresponding to the need and to the task of sorting out the, uh, the conflict and is not necessarily leading to any um, possible solution because what we hear from, from the Russian side, we hear that they want the peacekeeping mission on the same touchline where we have special monitoring mission of the OSCE, uh, protecting OSCE monitors. So I just want to remind everybody who, is, who exactly is the party that is attacking OSCE uh, monitors all the time. It's definitely not the Ukrainian military that is standing uh, on that touchline from the uh, Kyiv controlled uh, territories. Then uh, they, are, uh, they are suggesting that we have to agree with this um, so-called uh, authorities of the so-called uh, and basically only puppet uh, um, administrations um, uh, of the occupied territories of Donbass. So not with the Russian Federation, for example, and this is definitely something that Ukraine cannot agree to. And they do not want to see the peacekeeping on the uh, border between Ukraine and Russian Federation. And I want to remind why we wanted to to have the peacekeeping because it was impossible for the OEC monitors uh, to monitor the 400 uh, kilometer long border between Ukraine and Russian Federation. They had access only to four kilometers of the whole uncontrolled border and all the flow of the um, weaponry, of the um, ammunition of the uh, regular forces of the Russian Federation, of the trainers of the Russian Federation has not been controlled. So we are interested in a genuine peacekeeping mission that would ensure the, the withdrawal of all of these weapons, withdrawal of all of these regular troops, and also mercenaries that have been uh, now part of, the, um, of this um, attack on Ukraine, and protect not protect, but uh, monitor the border between Ukraine and Russian Federation so that we can try to get back to normal and try to reintegrate uh, and try to work with our people and get to any political, political messages. So it is a very um, narrow opening, I would say. 
but again, we are trying to uh, use every single possibility to, um, to find the solution by political and diplomatic means. And, and that's why we are ready to uh, you know, take this into discussion. But again, there are very serious and very clear red lines that Ukraine is not going to, to uh, cross um, mm -hmm. uh, for that matter in, in UN peacekeeping mission. So I have many more questions, but I imagine that you do too. Uh, before I open it up, I would like to set some ground rules. Uh, before you speak, please introduce yourself with your name and your affiliation, if any. Um, please do ask a question. Um, I will cut you off if you start uh, developing a thesis. Um, and um, please do try to keep it short so we have time for as many questions as possible. Um, all right, uh, way in the back. Thank you. My name is David Nikuradze. I represent Georgian television station Rustavito in Washington, D.C. My question is more about uh, internal political issues of Ukraine. Um, ex Odessa governor and the former president of Georgia, who was stripped of Ukrainian citizenship a couple of months ago, entered Ukraine yesterday from Poland, apparently against the will of the Ukrainian government. I was wondering if you could give me your reaction on that, please. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Our president has reacted already to that um, uh, situation, and um, he insists that it has to be uh, dealt with in the legal um, realm, um, in the legal sphere, um, because th it has been a violation of the um, international border of Ukraine. So I hope that uh, our um, agencies responsible for, for such counteraction to, to illegal actions will, will be engaged. Um, I also want to remind the um, Georgian viewers, if they are viewing as well, that uh, Georgian state has also um, addressed Ukrainian authorities with the request for extradition of the uh, former govern governor of Ukraine, and for that matter, former president of, the, uh, of Georgia. So I'm sure that after the, you know, after um, the sorting out things um, with the breaking of the Ukrainian law, there will be also the necessity to sort out the things with breaking the Georgian law for uh, Mr. Sarkashvili. Okay, um, up in front. My name is Keith Smith. I used to be with CSIS for almost 10 years, and I'm with SIPA now. Uh, Ukraine has a lot of friends in Washington and uh, a lot of friends in the United States, more than they probably know about. But I just came back from Europe uh, recently, and I ha the Europeans have the same questions about Ukraine that, that, that we have here, and that's the pace of reform, economic reform, and the feel, fear that, in fact, reform is going backwards uh, rather than forwards. If you look at the amount of privatization that's taking place, it's minuscule compared to what the government's policy of Grossman came here to Washington, put out a very nice fancy thing about the, pay, the reforms that were going to take place. It was very great. It was good. But it hasn't taken place in most cases. And the question is, uh, without IMF pushing on, the, it, would the pace of reforms in fact go backwards? And what do you, how do you see the next six months? or the next RADA session as far as pushing reforms through? Because it's very important as far as support here and in Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Keith, and I'm happy to see you here. We've known each other for a while. Um, OK, um, and f thank you very much for this, uh, for this question. It's extremely important to understand that, unfortunately, what we are trying to deal with is a much rustier system than we would immediately imagine on the surface. And that's my personal experience. I'm coming to the, um, to the government and I came to the parliament from the civil society world, basically. And so for me, it was al always, um, I knew the answers. I really knew what to do. Um, it was so easy to advise when you were out of the system. But once you are becoming part of the system, and when you see how the system is unfortunately pretty resilient and also is process oriented as opposed to result oriented and, and it gets um, uh, you much more um, effort and force to, 
to get to the result, uh, then you understand um, you know, all the difficulties of what's going on. But at the same time, I would uh, disagree with you that uh, uh, reforms are going backwards because I think we have managed really um, a very serious um, set of steps in Ukraine in all different spheres um, which are um, gradually taking us to, to a better level of regulation, better level of uh, more transparent le level of regulation, more um, understandable and clear um, rules and, and, and uh, procedures um, also for that matter, uh, also comparable and interoperable with the, um, in, in already quite a few areas with European ones as well. And, um, and we have been working very hard on also closing the um, loopholes in our uh, legislation and our procedures, which were uh, mm, calling for corruption prone activities. And I would name several several um, examples of that, of those activities. For example, the uh, system of electronic procurement, Trezoro, that has been used and has become uh, obligatory exactly a year ago in Ukraine. What it allowed for, it allowed for to, to save up to 15% of the money that was foreseen in the, uh, in the state budget for the state, uh, for, for the public procurement, which means that we have closed quite a lot of, of loopholes where, uh, where the money was staying in some strange pockets, for example, but, and that is part of the, part of the reform and part of the reform agenda. Uh, and the results, uh, results are very clear and very tangible and you can, you can feel the result. Also, um, you know, I wouldn't have imagined, and, and we, can, we can say about, um, you know, the slowness of reforms, but I think that there is, there is no precedent in the world when the country was fighting the war, at the same time changing, going through such a transition, such a deep transition from the very uh, first moments of uh, 2014 of, uh, um, March of 2014, when we had in our in our treasury, we had ten thousand dollars, and we had our national reserves being five billion uh, five billion dollars. Uh, they have been lowered, and the whole you know the whole country was was just uh, everybody was sure that we are moving. Excuse me, excuse me, <laughs> directly to a default. It didn't happen. Now our national reserves, uh, our currency reserves is, uh, are 18 billion, yes, because of the engagement of the IMF, but also because of the, of the homework that Ukraine has been doing. Um, and we are going, and ec economy is not waiting for, uh, you know, for a ceasefire. That's also, we have to understand that more than 5% of our GDP, we are paying to security and defense when resources are scarce, when resources would have been beneficial to being used for, for economy, right? And this is the price we are paying. Moreover, somehow nobody is, is thinking of the fact that about other, like probably about one or 1 1.5 of this GDP is also go, uh, of, uh, of the uh, budget is going also to take care of the, um, uh, of the social care that we have to provide as a state for the victims of the war, for the internally displaced people. So it's a huge number of resources that is also being taken away from the developmental um, strategy. And I want to remind you, 20% of GDP has been lost because of the loss of the territories that are not right now under control of, of Ukraine. So with all of this, trading partners, you know, we have been focused on Russian Federation for ages, for all the 23 years after the independence was before the revolution of dignity. And only now we have almost uh, 550 days that we are going through without buying any gas from the Russian Federation. This, is, this was incredible to imagine. 
Isn't that a reform? Isn't that a, a very clear agenda, what we are doing? Equalizing the prices for the households and for the, inter, uh, for, for the uh, uh, enterprises for, for gas, which has closed the biggest loophole, the biggest, the biggest area where most of the money, well, most of the corruption money was made in Ukraine for decades. We have closed this, and for the first time, the Naftogas gas company is finally beneficial. Uh, um, in, in 2016, for the first time, more than over a decade. So all of this um, uh, doesn't allow me to, to speak about uh, about uh, you know any rollback of the reform. And uh, right now, we have on the table for um, for consideration of the parliament several uh, major. Um, packs of the documents that have been prepared uh, by the government, and this is uh, the, the um, education reform, medical reform, and pension reform. All of these are very painful. All of these are not an easy ones to, to go through, but we are hoping for, for, the, for the support of the uh, parliament. Also, uh, as you're rightly pointing out, mm. privatization, that has been on the table for a long time. And, uh, and uh, I'm very, very hopeful that finally, before the end of this year, we will start a real uh, privatization. But we see already uh, that, unfortunately, that part of the system that is not yet um, reformed, which is our judiciary, is actually creating quite a problematic background for the privatization. And that's, that's once that is pushed, I think then we are much better uh, off uh, set for for privatization, and uh, and and I'm absolutely open about this. Then decentralization isn't that a huge reform in Ukraine, which has been always so so centered, and always all the money was coming to, from all the regions to the center, and only then uh, distributed to the regions. Now we have almost uh, up to 50 percent of the of the taxes that are staying on the local level which allows the local communities to provide better services to this we have started huge infrastructural program uh, programs back in 2014 we had like up to 100 kilometers of the of the roads uh, that have been repair repaired uh, in ukraine and this year it's about 3,000 uh, kilometers of the roads well this is Big. It's not enough, but all of this is in the same, and, and, and you know, and all of this is is allowing for additional um, impetus of economic development. And 2.2 percent of growth by the end of the last year definitely is not something that we would wish for, uh, but it's definitely about um, getting healthier as economy. Not we are not there yet, but we are definitely in in the direction that we have chosen three years ago. Uh, up front here. Agnia Grigas, Atlantic Council. Um, since you mentioned that Ukraine is no longer buying Ru Rus well gas from the Russian Federation, how optimistic are you that Ukraine will boost its own domestic natural gas production? Because certainly the reserves are there. And second question, uh, are you concerned about uh, Zappa 2017? Thank you. Um, Yes, we are concerned by Zappa 2017. It starts in two, three days. Um, and um, I think we are not the only ones who are concerned. And uh, uh, we understand that uh, very well, unfortunately, the concentration of forces that will be brought, uh, that are being brought from the Russian Federation to Belarus could be um, um, left behind on the territory of Belarus and create yes, yet another pad for attack both on Ukraine and also um, as a deterrence um, capability for the, um, for the European Union and NATO countries. And we see the preparations also and the actions that NATO has been taking in response to all of this uh, developments lately as well on its eastern borders and in, in eastern um, in nations that are on the eastern borders of the of NATO. So um, I think we all have to be soberly looking at and very attentively watching what's going on there and, ha and having to be ready and prepared to, to counteract. And the good thing is that over this years we have actually managed to um, recreate 
from basically from ashes, from uh, consciously destroyed armed forces in Ukraine, uh, a capable armed force which is yet, yet far from the ideal, but definitely absolutely capable to, to withheld the aggression and to withheld and, and, and counteract this. With regard to um, natural, natural gas production, well, actually I should also mention I'm very happy that uh, we have had already the first uh, uh, um, shipment of the U.S. Um, coal to Ukraine already coming in, which is also really uh, diversifying our you know, ability to provide for our um, um, energy security in Ukraine. And in terms of natural gas production, you are very right that we have actually adopted a um, plan, internal plan for development of the uh, more um, robust capabilities in terms of national uh, gas production. This year, we already had the increase, which is not maybe huge, but uh, almost uh, 700 million uh, cubic um, tons. How do you call it? Meat. Mm. Cubic meters, tons, right? Meters. <laughs> meters. Cubic meters, meters. that's uh, right. Um, in comparison to 2016, in our uh, low, uh, internal national production, and the plan is by 2020 really to have increased by, by several billion, uh, which will allow us to, to almost to e exclusively depend on our own internal resources for the basic needs of the country. So uh, yes, it is all, all our, on our agenda. But you know, once you again, when I was talking about rusty uh, situation, it's also a very um, uh, In, in, in practice, it's really rusty because, for example, all the equipment that has been there for the state companies that have been operating the natural uh, gas resources extraction in Ukraine, it turns out that they have been not changed since like 60s or 70s and they are outdated and nobody really cared and nobody really uh, made any investment in order to, to upgrade the, the, uh, both uh, the equipment and the, the uh, technologies that were used. So therefore that's exactly one of the focuses that we are right now um, focusing our attention of the government as well. Um, already um, in the uh, back, second from the back. Green shirt. Thank you. Evgen Zahudayev, uh, Center for International Security and Policy Studies, Studies at University of Maryland. Uh, could you please highlight what has, has been done by Ukrainian government in terms of ensuring and advancing European and Atlantic security and uh, in, uh, ensuring EU, uh, Ukraine, NATO uh, uh, advancement? hoping that we were talking about all of this most of this time. Um, okay, I'll try. Having the association agreement between Ukraine and the EU gives us a very clear uh, map of actions in terms of what has to be changed, where, in which, um, in which sphere and how. Uh, and, um, and that is the plan for basically 10 years of um, approximation of the, the um, uh, European legislation into Ukrainian, um, into Ukrainian one. And it has to happen at the same time while, while getting rid of the, um, still, you would be surprised, quite a few functioning so Soviet rules and procedures which, you know, are unnecessary as regulation. Just a couple of months ago, we had an act, uh, one of the uh, cabinet of ministers' seatings when we actually at one at one sitting. Well, it was for a long time pre prepared, but we um, decided to to cut off basically 600 of the existing regulatory documents. It had to be. We had to make sure that you know everything will not be ruined after we we do that. 
But this is very important. They have been all coming also from 80s, from 70s, from the Soviet Union, and, and uh, uh, making it much more difficult work of the businesses, for example, of the enterprises and so on. So um, we can talk about every single area, what exactly we are doing. Um, and we, you know, we can start from um, security of the uh, um, safe, uh, not security, safety of the products that we are eating, and start uh, and uh, uh, creating the whole system of control of the um, safety of the of the food that that we are getting to our stores, and going on to specific, very specific, both uh, uh, military and um, command standards that we are trying to introduce in, in, the, uh, in the military. So I think it's a discussion for a bit longer than, than this time that it allows for. I'll be happy maybe to send you some information on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's, it's huge endeavor. Critique about the slow pace of reforms in Ukraine, but I worked on the reforms in Ukraine before I came to study at the University of Maryland, and I know that it's hard. And I just wanted you like to kind of mention big achievements that what has been done in short period of time. Well, remember only about banks, for example. I can I cannot imagine any other country that within uh, basically two years would close uh, one half of its banks that happen to be insolvent. And that means that we have cleared up the whole system of banking, which is returning the trust of people to, to, to the banks. This is not easy. It's not, you know, it's not a popular move when we're, you are closing the bank where, where people have entrusted both for, for debits and credits, right? So this is uh, extremely uh, difficult. Then, um, again, as I said about energy, as I said, uh, and, and we also have started very serious programs on energy efficiency as well, uh, which has not been paid attention to over Soviet times. You know, energy was never a scarce commodity. Um, energy was never expensive. People in Ukraine have not been taught to pay high prices for energy. They are not happy for that. The, uh, they just believe it, it comes for granted. And that's a big, also a, a uh, mental change as well. We have to understand that, that once you have to actually think maybe you close the window or you, you will, um, when, uh, when it's heated inside, or you don't want to turn on the heat, or we finally are introducing obligatory meters, metering system. It has not been there. So for, for, for the, for the uh, separate house, uh, households, it was there, but not for the apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. And so then the losses were somehow calculated, and somehow someone had to be paying for that. And all of this was just money and sinking, and resources shrink, sinking through the, you know, the, the hands of people, basically, and, and, and not uh, working for the country, not working for the state. So in every single area, we are just, you know, locking the... Um, the, the, the loopholes and, and trying to provide for other opportunities. And we see already that we, you know, very slowly, but uh, we, uh, the um, credit and, and uh, um, ratings for Ukraine have been coming up gradually to positive ones. And I think all of this is about, you know, macroeconomic stabilization, but it does not immediately tra translate into well-being of a people. So once you have the, the GDP growth of 2.2%, 2, 2 it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that tomorrow you are able to, to provide, you know, everybody to the best of their ability to fulfill themselves. Unfortunately not. Unfortunately not. But that does not mean that we are not on this, on this uh, road. And, and, and we can see that what we could have done and we have done, we have also raised the, the uh, minimum wage for Ukrainian people. We are hoping that uh, pension reform will come through and that will provide, it's not an easy step, but that will provide for uh, over time for us closing the, you wouldn't even think of that we, we, because the system is different here in, in the US of pensions, but we have about 50% of the deficit of the pension fund on Ukraine. So if we do not do the reform, 
our, um, our ability to pay pensions in a couple of years will depend on, on whether we do it or not. So it's about our survival. It's about um, very practical things. Mm -hmm. So we are the major stakeholders of reforms. We just cannot allow not to do this. So it's not only about IMF. Because if, uh, if it was only IMF, we wouldn't do it. We wouldn't be able to do it if it wasn't for the, for the ability of the people inside the uh, authorities, in, this, in the parliament, in the government, in the um, president's administration, and for the, for the uh, non-governmental organizations, for the pretty mature civil society that is staying engaged after Maidan. That wasn't the, uh, the case before. And, and through the pressure and engagement of the uh, in international partners, that's how we are moving forward. Uh, n without any of these components, it wouldn't be possible. And healthcare reform. I mean, and healthcare, healthcare reform. That's, that's again, that's a huge. I mean, um, it's only one of the steps that has been done as a temporary matter. And again, um, we have, uh, in 2015, we took the decision, temporary decision, to transfer some of the procurement of the uh, medicine in Ukraine to international organizations because medicine procurement uh, for basic uh, needs um, of the, that, that we are providing as a state to the people, we have saved up to, up to 40% of the money that was foreseen for the public procurement of, of, uh, of medicine which we understand that was a, a really corruption, uh, corruption scheme. So, and right now we are creating an internal agency that will be you know, created by totally new rules with totally um, newly um, selected people to work there in order to take it over again back to the state but do it according to the standards and uh, procedures that are done by the international organizations and that I hope will you know will ensure that further on we doing the, the same work in the country uh, by our own means, uh, but we will do it as efficiently as effectively as international organizations do. So all of this, and it's happening in all the areas. So that's why it's very difficult to to just focus on one. All right, uh, up front, uh, second row. Thank you. Um, I'm Sam Kramer from Georgetown University, and uh, I'd like to ask you reg uh, about how you feel Ukrainian public opinion stands regarding the uh, civil war in the Donbas and uh, really the willingness of the public to continue reforms. It's been, after all, almost three years, and public opinion seems to be wavering, at least as far as it can be ascertained from the US. First and foremost, there is no civil war in Donbass. No. There is a Russian aggression on the territory of Ukraine with Russian regular forces, which are about 5,000 today, these days, on the territory of Donbass, with about 35,000 of mercenaries and, yes, people also gathered from Ukrainians, trained, controlled by the Russian army, uh, managed by the Russian army, being part of two uh, mm, military corps of the Russian army um, that are functioning on the territory of Donbass. Uh, the number of equipment, starting from, for example, more than 670 tanks on that territory, does not, uh, I hope, for everybody is pretty clear and, and, and does not uh, allow for a thought that they have digged this uh, equipment somewhere from the uh, mines in Donbass. That was one of the arguments, by the way, of the Russian Federation somehow in the court um, uh, in, uh, it, 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 on the UN um, court. So that's extremely important. With regard, uh, people are definitely emotionally and morally and economically drained. There is no question about that. But that does not mean that there has been a diminishing support for European choice of Ukraine. No. 
uh, people would like to have to see the um, faster results of the reforms and I think that we are all um, it's only natural for uh, for all of us to expect that action will provide the result very soon since we are all functioning in the um, in the um, in our lifespan and, and in our expectation from from life um, however uh, the results some of the results of the actions that are taken uh, being taken um, today will be felt in a couple of years only and that's the if you look at the experience of uh, um, reform of the other countries that's the same thing the 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 results of the reforms have been felt within like five, seven, 12, eight years in different, in different countries for, for different, but we were actually uh, in different period of time, but we were looking at the, like Slovakia, we were looking at Poland, we were looking at uh, Georgia for that matter as well, and we saw that there, there needs to be a, a time when the actions are made in order to see the results um, uh, later on. So um, I think, um, it's um, the choice is there for people. The support of the choice is there. Um, most of the people, again, about more than sixty percent, are also supporting the need to reintegrate the Donbass and, and in, um, by by diplomatic and political means to regain it and then to work with those territories. So we have the majority in all the uh, in all the areas. Um, also, we have never had this before, but we right now have more than fifty percent of the Ukrainian population willing uh, uh, um, supporting. NATO um, membership as a goal of Ukraine, and 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 uh, we, I just think that we have to work further with the public opinion in Ukraine, as well, explaining very seriously what are the next steps, what exactly has to be done in order this or that to be achieved. But that's hard work, and it's much easier and uh, um, you know to to fall into populistic slogans. And here we are very. Um, uh, very European. We have lot, lots of uh, homemade populists, and uh, uh, this is the trend that we are fully following, following through. Unfortunately, it's one, it's one form of integration. <laughs> <laughs> you already had it, uh, Jeff. Thank you, um, Jeff Mankoff with CSIS, and actually I had two quick questions for you. Um, the first has to do with the implementation of the Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement with the EU. Um, now that that has been has come into effect, what is the next milepost um, in terms of Ukraine's EU integration? What is the next goal that you're pursuing? Um, and the second question has to do with Crimea. Uh, we've talked about Donbass, we haven't really talked about Crimea. Um, what are the prospects for the reintegration of Crimea and what steps is Ukraine taking to promote it? Um, thank you. With the DCFTA, um, it has been operational already in the temporary regime. Um, as of the beginning of 2016. And therefore, um, we already have some first results of it. We have 41% of our trade um, that is now par part uh, of uh, our Ukraine-EU trade um, portfolio. Uh, and, and these numbers have grown immensely over the last um, three years. Um, and this is also the result of the possibilities and access of the Ukrainian products and, and uh, Ukrainian companies to the European markets as well. Um, and the result also of quite a few different transformations that we've done in order to make sure that our, uh, our companies can be licensed and certified in order to have access with their products to, to the EU markets. For example, it was not even uh, thought of uh, that that our milk uh, products will be having access to to the EU markets and that's a big step forward for us for example um, we um, so and DCFTA it's a very routine and very sometimes boring some it's not a sexy type of work unfortunately you know it's a, it's something that where you have to change the regulations somehow some something where you have to provide for a system of control some some something that you have to provide for a system of of laboratory testing for example in some areas uh, in making sure that uh, 
that all of this working along. So it's it's pretty boring stuff. It's it's um, not as easy to sell to people, so to say, quote and unquote, to sell as visa free. You know, we have been doing the uh, really very serious transformation, really very serious changes in Ukraine because of the requirements of the visa liber liberalization action uh, plan in Ukraine. And finally, this was the decision by the EU, which is felt by every single citizen. Even that one that doesn't have the the intention to travel today, but all of them have started to, to line up in, for, for, uh, in queues to get the biometrical passport in order just to have this opportunity to travel. And, and that's, that creates another part of self-dignity and self-respect that I think is also part of the, of the achievement as such, um, as the visa-free. So nothing is that exciting in this DCFTA that you would feel immediately uh, for every single citizen. Um, so that's why we are setting a, you know, a ambitious additional goals for ourselves where we, we are talking about um, um, at some point adherence to, and as being associated with the Schengen zone, with the uh, uh, customs union of the EU, uh, with the um, um, open air um, agreement of the EU, so uh, with the energy union of the European Union, with the uh, um, digital, digital uh, community of the EU, which is right now is being basically formed, so we're trying to be part of, of already thinking of the, of the agenda for that. So, but that, all of this is much less uh, and immediately having um, uh, appealing um, uh, understanding for, for every single citizen. And that's why it's, it's differ, more difficult to, um, to, to communicate and more difficult to, again, quote and unquote, to sell. And the Crimea, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a really tough call. And um, I don't know if you're following the, the things, just um, basically today there was another um, Convictory um, conviction of the uh, head of the Mid of the chairman of the Majlis of the Crimean Tatars that was sentenced to eight years of in prison on the territory of the Russian Federation for what Russian Federation is calling the uh, the the oh, how, do, how do they call this um, referent of. Uh, volunteer right referendum when, when Crimea decided, uh, so to say, to, to become part of the uh, Russian Federation. And this, uh, this person, Ahmed Chigis, he is sentenced to eight years of, of uh, prison, of Russian prison today, because he disagreed then, because he called on uh, Crimean Tatars to come out to the streets and actually show that it's not the uh, volunteer decision of the uh, uh, Crimean people to uh, to become part of the uh, uh, of the uh, Russian Federation. I, I always want to say Soviet Union because it is real uh, concentration camp of the Soviet Union. That's what they turned Crimea into, uh, from the from the uh, tourist resort to a military base that is heavily armed right now. So I do understand that it's a, a long, uh, I think all of, all of us, we understand that this is a long road to go. Um, and um, uh, I'll be probably um, not opening again any secret that we are looking at the experience of, uh, for example, Baltic states, which had unfortunately a very long period when they came back to being independent and, and, being, uh, and, and governing themselves the way they wanted to. I want to believe that it won't take 50 years, as it did in the in, um, case of Baltic states. But we are happy that there is resilience, uh, resistance still in the, uh, in the territory of occupied illegally annexed Crimea. But unfortunately, Russia is doing everything to, um, uh, to, to, to spread fear, to spread uh, attacks and, and um, um, tortures on those people who are uh, trying to show even slightest disagreement with the Russian regime on the uh, occupied and illegally annexed territory of Crimea. So it's not going to be an easy call. But we are trying to use all the opportunities and also in the international uh, area as well. We are running low on time, so what I'm going to do, if it's all right with you, is take three questions and then give you a chance to respond to them, and then maybe it'll be a little more. Uh, so up here in the front. 
Hi, I'm Damon Woods with Parnassus Global Agency. My question has to do with misinformation because we all have come to understand the power of misinformation coming out of Moscow. So what is the support that you uh, feel that Ukraine needs at this point to uh, counter misinformation and, and how would you see that support coming? Okay, let's um, go over here. Thank you. Nino Ciaparidze, Edison Research. Could you focus for a minute on uh, Ukraine's upcoming elections? And if you were, to, of course, you have Ukraine's health um, and uh, strength in mind. If you were to imagine all the threats, with the exception of territorial integrity threats that you already spoke about, um, what other threats do you think could potentially be a serious problem? Uh, uh, when uh, the election environment becomes heated. Um, thank you. And how to avoid them? How will you prepare for that? Thank you. Such simple questions you're getting. Mm -hmm. they, um, for one minute. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right here. Hi, my name is Hany Nasser. I'm with the Canadian Embassy here in Washington. Um, over the last couple of months, the U.S. military, and specifically General Mattis, has come out in favor of providing uh, defense of lethal aid, which you mentioned in your speech, to Ukraine. Uh, my question is, although you're not in the U.S. administration, could you perhaps talk about your views of maybe the motivation for this slight change in U.S. policy? Is it just further action against Russia for its election meddling? Um, do, do you believe that this will um, put Russia, push Russia back a little bit? And could you maybe talk about uh, <coughs> the, the potential risks? Um, is there a risk for escalation by Russia? Thank you very much. I think Secretary Mattis was actually very careful, and I think we just, to, you know, I, I read the policy as being remarkably consistent with the Obama administration policy, which is, we're thinking about it. <laughs> we're still thinking. <laughs> so just, just to kind of clarify the U.S., I'm also not in the administration, obviously, but just, I do follow this pretty closely. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for raising the issue of um, misinformation, and that's probably the um, most tender way to put it, <laughs> because it's, uh, um, it, it's much stronger than, than just m misinforming. It's uh, deliberately creating lies. It's about deliberate, uh, deliberate manipulation that we, of the facts and, and, uh, and narratives that we are seeing working uh, from Russia, both in Ukraine and um, in the European countries, and unfortunately getting also that here and that that starts from very simple things as as we've heard today about like civil quote and unquote civil war in Ukraine which is not the case but once you repeat and repeat and repeat some of the uh, titles that you, that uh, Russian uh, Russia has come up with then you think that this is this is then you are, you are starting already from uh, from uh, not truth when you are trying to, to analyze the situation. And that's, that's scary. And that's exactly what is happening with a lot of uh, misinformation, with a lot of propaganda that is being brought by Russian Federation upon our nations. And we all, I think, uh, have uh, been pretty unarmed. And it's not about Ukraine being in need for um, support in this, uh, in this matter. I think we here, we can be together uh, much more efficient if we work together. Here, Ukraine can be a contributor with the knowledge that we have received already now. The only thing is that we are running the marathon with a sprint of speed. So we do not really have uh, enough time and human resources to stand, uh, st stand and reflect on things and package them in a, in a positive way and, 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 and transfer them as knowledge to our partners. So working together and, and, and basically forming the, the groups that would be analyzing the trends together, that would be producing some hints and some um, uh, uh, analyzing the instruments that have worked uh, in Ukraine or in other countries and producing this as a, as a if you want, a, if a template for others to use and to watch for. That would be something I think very useful. So here I would see Ukraine as being a real serious partner and, and, and able and capable to provide uh, a serious input. Um, and, and not falling into traps of misinformation. I think that would be the biggest support for Ukraine for that matter. Uh, 
hold on, where did I put the questions? Uh, um. The upcoming elections, well, um, I hope they are coming on time, that is uh, in 2019, so we do still have a kind of a, but there are quite a few forces back in Ukraine who want to make sure that they are coming as soon as possible, and one of the, one, uh, and we could see this with all the, uh, with all the fuss about the uh, uh, crossing of the uh, attempt of crossing of the border uh, by former uh, governor of the of Odessa region, former president of uh, Georgia, Sarkisvili, we can see how all of the political forces have become really, uh, especially those ones that are that, that are eager to to increase their presence in the in the Rada how they have all decided uh, become agitated and hoping that maybe okay maybe this is the case where we where we'll get uh, to a snap elections which would not be a positive thing right now for Ukraine I think that's again uh, because I think that that uh, you know any country before elections is falling into into agitation and populism m mode and there are quite a few attempts, attempts already to, to do this in Ukraine already now, but I think we have at least a year of possibilities to work before election mode will fully switch on, to work with the parliament, to work with the government, and to deliver the, the necessary actions that would be producing results for people. So um, what, what are the uh, risks? Well, starting from propaganda, uh, starting from information, misleading information to populism to uh, to eagerness to get quick answers to simple answers to difficult questions, and falling into this trap of uh, of um, readiness also for revenge. I think that's another that's another uh, scary. Uh, tendency that might be uh, faced by by Ukraine, and for us, it's important. That's why it's important for us to make sure that we are making all the changes that we are making are irreversible. That they are set in stone. That they and this, I think, this is the major answer to any of the challenges that we will be seeing during uh, election time. Uh, defensive lethal weapons. Uh, I think that part of the mm, rhetoric about um, being afraid of escalation with Russian Federation um, after giving Ukrainians some um, lethal weapons, that's a remnant of this uh, narrative of the appeasement uh, of the aggressor. And somehow we are forgetting the experiences that we had long ago, that we had back in, in um, you know, in early, in late 30s and uh, early 40s uh, as, as Europe as such. And I uh, would like to just mention one, one number. Oh, after we have received medium uh, range radars as a defensive equipment, the death toll from the mortar uh, fire has dropped from 43% to 17. This is about saving lives. So we are talking about long range um, uh, radars in order to be able, A, to protect ourselves, and B, in order to make sure that there is an understanding on the other side, which is, the, which is not getting any other language besides the language of force and power and, and, and pressure and strength that the price for attacking is high, that the price of attacking Ukraine is unbearable for that other country. And then it means that we, you, we, we have never asked for any foreign military presence to defend our, our, ourselves on our territory. We didn't ask for a NATO boot in Ukraine, you know, as a, as a, as a military force. We are asking for the, for the support which will make us more capable in defending ourselves and, for that matter, defending Europe. And, you know, we can close eyes on the fact that Ukraine is defending Europe, uh, Europe today. Ukraine is a frontier. Ukraine is a uh, stronghold. 
and and uh, we and and the fact that Ukraine is holding that fire there is giving the possibility to Europe and the West to consolidate itself, to actually think, reflect, to plan their actions, to to arrange for unity, which is very important for I think for the, the uh, survival and development of, of the of the globe as such. Do you have enough radars? No. Yeah. And I hope uh, just to, to maybe counter a bit our conversations with the American mm -hmm. administration right now um, are actually leading us to hope that the decision is very close. So it's not only along the lines of the Obama administrations that, okay, we are considering this, but I think that discussions are coming to much mm -hmm. more technical yeah. uh, issues that are hopefully going to, to translate in this in this I decision. just, you know, my own, my own experience with this program is that you, there, there are some very useful pieces of USAID, um, but there's not enough of them. And I would focus on more radars and more communications equipment and more of the things that troops in the field really need to save their lives than on the shiny anti-tank weaponry that, you know, it, it sends lots of signals, but it doesn't necessarily... Both are needed. Yeah. Both of you. You know, we could we could go on for a very long time. Um, I um, I think you know I'm, I'm so grateful to Ivana Klimperts and Sadze, the Vice um, Prime Minister of Ukraine for European Euro Atlantic Integration, for joining us Thank today you. because I think it is so critical, as I said at the start, to hear the Ukrainian view on this. This is about Ukraine, and um, we cannot understand Ukraine, and we can't make decisions about Ukraine without listening, uh, without listening to Ukraine. So, and please do not make any decisions about Ukraine without Ukraine. Absolutely. Thank you. On that. <laughs>